Welcome to the overview of Mark chapter 9. I am so proud of you that you continue to grow with us in our daily growth book. I know it's not easy to be consistent in studying the word, but this is how we grow. We grow through knowledge of God's word. All we're doing is giving some opportunity, some time, for the Holy Spirit to begin to teach us and help us understand who God is and the promises of his word. Let's look at Mark chapter 9 and let's go with verse, let's start with verse 1. And this is what it says. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of heaven arrive in great power. The kingdom of God arrive in great power. Jesus is now predicting or he's prophesying that some of the disciples that are that he's speaking to that he's teaching will see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. You know what it means? They're going to get a glimpse of heaven. They're going to see how heaven really works. They're going to see the power of God. And this is where it starts in verse two. Six days later, they see it. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. Let me stop there. It's really important to be able to be led by God's Spirit to be alone with Him. This is the beginning of getting greater, greater revelation from God. There were 12 disciples. Only three of them were led up into the mountain. Every day, God wants to lead us in alone time with Him so He could reveal Himself to us. Let's take a look at it. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. They saw Jesus in a way they've never seen him. They seen him as light, a dazzle. So it was dazzling white. They saw, sh saw him shining and this shine did not come from the outside in is what it came from it came from the inside out they actually saw Jesus this got a glimpse of his glory of his power of his light but then they saw Elijah and Moses now how did they know it was Elijah and Moses this is the same way when we go to heaven we're gonna know one another they just knew Remember, they were getting a glimpse of the kingdom of God. They were starting to see things the way they really were in the spiritual realm. Now, Elijah and Moses were there, and they didn't recognize them because they saw a picture of them. There was no such thing as pictures like that at this time. They knew them spiritually. Now, they also were getting a glimpse of eternity. That Elijah and Moses understand Elijah passed 900 years ago or he was gone 900 years ago Moses died 1400 years ago and now that we're seeing them alive think about it God was beginning to reveal to them that there's such thing as life after that death there's eternity and I believe that Jesus showed them this to remind them remember I'm going to re resurrect from the dead I'm the resurrection and the life. So when I tell you that I'm going to resurrect in three days, it is going to happen. There's life after death. Now, this is what happens. Elijah and Moses are talking to Jesus. And I wonder what they're talking about. Well, the Bible does give us a glimpse of what they're talking about. Jesus is talking to them about the end of his life. He's going to begin to talk to the disciples about the end of of his life the disciples don't truly understand why he came he came to die and suffer for the sins of mankind and then resurrect from the dead they don't understand this they actually think that he's coming to establish a physical kingdom on earth and they're going to rule with him then this is what the bible says in verse 7 then a cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. 
This, this is very important part of scripture because Elijah represented the prophets and Moses represented the law. And Mo, the law, this is what it did. It showed us the standards of God, but it also showed us that each one of us falls short of the standards of God. You know what it means? It shows us that we're sinners. The other day, um, there were some police officers came to our church and they were looking at our red zones er, areas where people were parking and they warned us. They said, look, today we're gonna give you a break. We're not gonna give you tickets, but there's people parking in the red zone areas. What the, what the police officers were doing was reminding us of our sin. And that's exactly what the law does. The Ten Commandments, thou shall not commit adultery. Uh-oh, we're committing adultery. Thou shall not lie. Mm, I've lied. And the law, no matter how well we try to obey it, we're going to fall short of it. It shows us that we're sinners in need of, of a Savior. Now, the prophets, their responsibility was to call people back to the Lord. And also, they prophesied that one day, Jesus would come. So the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, were pointing to Jesus. And now the Father says, look, listen to Jesus. The laws and law and the prophet are pointing to a Savior. Your need of a Savior. Here he is. Listen to him alone. And what happened after that? Elijah and Moses disappeared. And what, what, what the Father was saying, pro the prophets and Moses and the law have fulfilled their purpose. Jesus is here now. Listen to him. He's the savior of the world. After that encounter, the disciples were really confused because Jesus said, don't tell anybody what you saw. I know you saw a glimpse of heaven. You saw me in my, glor my glorified state and you heard the father, but don't tell anyone what you saw until the son of man has risen from the dead. Here he is, Jesus introducing again he's gonna raise from the dead but the Bible says that they didn't have a clue what he was talking about they didn't know what he meant by raising from the dead so Jesus wants to spend time with his disciples he wants to share who he is what he's ready to do the disciples in this chapter seem like they're not getting it so Jesus is gonna is gonna state it over and over again he says it one more time here in verse 12, and it says, Yet why do, you, why do the scriptures say that the Son, Jesus said this, that the Son must suffer greatly and be treated with other, utter contempt? He's letting them know, I know you guys are thinking I'm coming to establish a kingdom where we're going to overthrow the Roman Empire and you're going to rule with me. That's going to happen one day. But here I came to suffer and die for the sins of mankind and overthrow a demonic kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of sin, the kingdom of death. Now, we go into the second section of this chapter, and this section is interesting because we find the, the religious, script, uh, religious leaders arguing again with the disciples. And they're arguing about something interesting. We find out that they're arguing because the disciples were trying to cast out of a demon, out of a, of a boy, and they couldn't cast the demon out. Just think about these religious leaders are criticizing the disciples for not being able to cast out a demon that they couldn't even cast out. So let's pick this up. There's a, there's a man that's brought his, ch his child that's demon-possessed to he, he brought him with intentions to bring him to Jesus to be healed. And this is what he does. He brings him to his disciples. And the disciples try to cast out this demon, but they couldn't. And this man now is speaking to Jesus. And he's saying, Jesus, this is what he says. He replied, says, he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire and into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Now, the disciples tried to cast out this demon, and they couldn't. And now he's bringing the same demon-possessed little boy to Jesus, and he's saying, have mercy. Maybe you can do this. I love this scripture where Jesus says, what do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. 
Anything is possible if a person believes. Jesus is saying, of course I can. The question isn't if I can cast out the demon. The question is, will you believe? Now, Jesus mentioned the reason that they couldn't cast out the demon is because there was, they didn't have enough faith. He described the whole generation as a faithless generation. A generation that doesn't have faith in Jesus is a generation that puts up, puts up with demons but doesn't cast them out. We're living in a generation that's putting up with demons. It's, I really believe we are in a place, in a faithless generation. But there's a group of believers that God is saying, hey, I've given you power to cast out demons. I've given you power to set people free. That's why I died and resurrected and given you my Holy Spirit. I believe, yes, there's a faithless generation, but there's also a generation with great faith that can help people that are hurting and broken. Now, Jesus, what he does, the disciples tried to cast out the demon and they couldn't. But Jesus cast out the demon. And this is what he said. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into a, into another violent convulsion and left him. Wow. Faith filled words out of the mouth of Jesus set this little boy free. Later on, the, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out the demon? And then Jesus said, These, this kind of demon only comes out through prayer and fasting. And what Jesus was saying is that you need to spend more time, personal time alone with me, separating yourself from the world, from the flesh. And this is what's going to happen. Your faith in me is going to grow and you'll be ready for this demon. This, you know what the scripture is saying? That not, not all of us are at the same spiritual level or walking in the same spiritual authority. But it is available to us. This is what we're doing right now. Spending a little time in the word. Spending a little time communicating with God. Prayer is just simply this. God speaking to me and I'm speaking to God. This is what we're doing today. Jesus is speaking to us through his word. So let's go on to the next section. Jesus reminds the, the, the disciples of the gospel. He needs to remind them again. Remember, he said that he was going to rise from the dead. He also said that he's going to suffer many terrible things. He's reminding them again. And this is in verse 30, verse 30, 31. Four, he wanted to spend time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying. However, they were afraid to ask him what he meant. Here we go again. The disciples, Jesus teaching, teaching, he takes them alone in order to teach them and to share the good news. Well, the good news is that Jesus came to die and suffer for the sins of mankind. We need a savior. The real good news is that Jesus wouldn't remain dead. He would resurrect from the dead and conquer the power of the devil, sin and death. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a reality. The price for sin must be paid for. Either we pay for it or we place our faith in the sacrifice that God has provided by giving his only son because he loves us so much to die in our place. Isn't that good news that we can be saved not based on our good works, but we can be saved on the work of Jesus Christ. He's reminding them because pretty soon Jesus is going to suffer. He's going to be betrayed and he's going to die and he's going to be buried and he's going to resurrect from the dead. The disciples don't understand it yet because they really think that Jesus is coming to establish and over this kingdom, physical kingdom on earth. Now, they start arguing as they're walking away from this, this conversation. 
the disciples start arguing among themselves. They're not arguing with the, the religious leaders and teachers. They're arguing among themselves. And this, and this is what I think this whole chapter is going over, over and over. The disciples are, have some, sh they're short-sighted and they have some shortcomings. And, and this is one of them. They're arguing and Jesus could overhear them arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Imagine them arguing, I'm going to be greater. No, I'm going to be greater. No, Jesus loves me more. No, Jesus loves me more. And when he establishes his kingdom, I guarantee you I'll be his right-hand person. Now, Jesus addresses this argument and with a powerful statement. And this is what he says in verse 35. Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Jesus begins to reveal the power of the kingdom. In this world, the people that are powerful are those who are ruling and leading and bossing people around. But Jesus said in the spiritual realm, in the kingdom of heaven, those who serve the most and serve the most amount of people are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. On this earth, <clears throat> we look at it differently. The person that's in charge and has the most people serving him is the greatest. But Jesus is saying, that's not how the kingdom of heaven works. If you want to be great in this kingdom, serve the greatest amount of people. Are we servant leaders? This is the idea. If the people will let us serve them, they'll let us lead them to Jesus Christ. Now we're going into the back part of this chapter and the disciples are making another mistake. We're seeing their shortcomings and their short-sightedness. They find a man that's casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And this is what they said in verse 30. John, John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. <laughs> Just think about that. So now the disciples are messing up again. And someone is using the name of Jesus and actually casting out demons. And they're saying, stop. You can't use that name because you're not in our group. Isn't that how most humans are? We're so, we're, we're so exclusive. That means if you don't do it the way we do it and you're not part of our group, what right do you have to claim that you're spiritual? What right do you have to use the name of Jesus? We're going to be surprised who God is going to use. We're going to be surprised, I think, a lot of us, who's going to be in heaven. They might not be doctrinally in agreement with every single one of us, but we're going to find out that they're going to be there. From all walks of people that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So they're casting out demons. Now Jesus says, don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. Now, Jesus is saying, don't stop them. Because even, even if their motives are off, this is what Jesus is saying. They're going to see the power of my name. And this is what's going to happen. They're going to be won over when they see the power of my name. You know what Jesus is saying? There's power in his name. Imagine there might be some people that don't know God as good as you, but they're using the name of Jesus and it's working for them. Why don't we go ahead and use the name of Jesus? And I think it's really important for us not to try to be the police, Holy Spirit police. I believe it's our responsibility to show grace, mercy, and love. Of course, teach the word of God and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and let God do the judging. <laughs> let, let God do the separating. So we go on, and Jesus is re reminding them, let them use my name. If they're not against us, they're for us. And now we go to the last section. And this last section, Jesus is reminding the disciples and every single one of us that there is eternal life and that there is eternal death or a hell. And he's warning, make sure you understand that there's an eternity waiting for you and cut off everything that will cut you off from eternal life 
and maybe even take you to hell. There's things that can actually take us to hell. And Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to, to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with, on, with only one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. Obviously, God is not talking about maiming yourself and plugging out physical lives, but he's talking about the spiritual. And he's saying if there's anything that will cut you off from God and stop you from believing in Jesus Christ and receiving the gift of eternal life, cut it off. It's also saying that sin has the power to cut us off from God and send us to hell. And he's saying it's a real place. Jesus is talking about heaven's a real place. And I hear people say, I believe in heaven. But do you believe in hell as well? Jesus here is doing a comparison contrast. He's talking about you can go to heaven or you can go to hell. He's describing both places not as a figment, not as a story, but he's saying it's a real place to be avoided at any cost. Jesus is saying right now, and he's talking to every one of us, is there anything that we need to cut off that's separating us from God? And we know what it could be. It could be something that we're touching with our hands, looking at with our eyes, whatever it is. What he's saying, cut it off, repent of it, turn to Jesus, and receive the gift of eternal life. Think about it. One day we'll be spending eternity in heaven or we'll be spending eternity in the everlasting hell forever and ever where nothing dies. I sure want to make sure that I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ. And I also want to make sure that you've done the same. And if you're saying, Pastor, I've heard the teaching today and I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior or there's something I need to repent of. You know what it is. It could be something that you've been battling with. It's okay. There's mercy and there's grace and there's love. Because Jesus is talking about hell, not because he hates us, because he loves us. He doesn't want us to go there. And he's saying, be aware of your eternity and be aware that your life is very short on this earth and don't miss it. What is a profit to gain the whole world and at the end, lose your soul? So if you're saying, Pastor, Pastor, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. I want eternal life. You can have it today. Why? Because Jesus already suffered and died and resurrected from the dead for our sins. The price has been paid for. All we have to do is place our faith in him. If you want to receive Jesus or repent of your sins, repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I know that my good works cannot save me. I believe that you suffered, you died, you were buried, and then you resurrected from the dead for my sins. You conquered the wage of sin, which is death. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place. I repent of my sins. Today, I cut off every sin that would separate me from you. Save me, set me free. I receive the free gift of eternal life. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it, congratulations. You're saved, you're born again, and you have eternal life and never have to fear hell because the price for your sins have already been paid for. God bless you. Let's continue growing in our daily growth book. I'm so proud of you. Let's keep going forward day by day. If you feel, felt you've been a little inconsistent, it's okay. Let's pick it up again and study the word on a daily basis. We love you so much. God bless. <laughs>